Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Brooke. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It, it's become uh, uh, somewhat of a tradition now for me around this time of year to visit Exeter. This is my, uh, my fourth time here. Uh, just in, in the name of full disclosure, uh, and, and, and maybe to, to uh, ease some, uh, maybe some tension, I will admit, although I've done so many, many times, I will admit to having been a socialist. Uh, and in my youth, I was a committed socialist until I was handed Atlas Shrugged at age 16, and which turned my world upside down is probably an understatement of the impact it had on, on my life then and really on the last 40 years since then. And it is indeed 40 years since I read Atlas Shrugged at age 16. You know, for 250 years, about, we have been running an experiment. And by we, I mean the human race has been running an experiment. We have tried numerous social systems. We have tried numerous political systems. We have tried numerous configurations. We have done so in a variety of different geographic locations says this is not any particular place or any particular time. And in a sense, we have tested a whole array of options. We have tested communism. We have tested capitalism. We have tested a variety of mixtures in between. And we continue to test those mixtures in between. And what's astounding to me, and I think to many people on my side of the aisle, if there, if there is anybody else with me on that side of the aisle, um, is that the results are indeed overwhelming. The results of this test for 250 years, because before 250 years, we all lived pretty much in the same kind of system, in the same kind of environment. We'll talk about a little bit about what life was like before then that over the last 250 years, the results have been overwhelmingly one-sided. If you care about human well-being, if you care about individual flourishing, if you care about health, if you care about life longevity, if you care about wealth, production, productivity, technology, innovation, fill in the blank of what you count as human flourishing, then capitalism has been an overwhelming, unmitigated, uncompromised success story. And socialism, in all its variants, has been an unmitigated, systematic, consistent, utter failure. Indeed, worse than a failure. There is no question then more people have been murdered, more people have been killed, more people have been s uh, slaughtered, more people have been starved purposefully, and often not purposefully, as a result of socialism than of any ideology in human history. Indeed, the experiment of the Soviet Union was a stunning experiment of murder and slaughter Somewhere over 100 million people were killed by the Soviet Union or let starve by the Soviet Union. And of course, that's just one part of the world. Mao Zedong's experimentation with communism led to the death of at least 60 million people, if not more. Over and over again, Socialism has produced nothing but starvation, destruction, and outright murder. On the other hand, capitalism, that evil doctrine that we all love to hate and love to condemn, has produced the wealth we all enjoy today. It has produced the technology that makes a lot of this room function. It has produced the personal prosperity many of us in this room enjoy. It has produced 
almost all the wealth that exists in modern society today. Capitalism is the system of property rights, as the system of individual rights, as a system of liberty and freedom, a system in which the government leaves people alone, leaves people free to pursue their own well-being, their own interests, their own values. The system of entrepreneurship and business has produced all the wonders that we have in our world today. Socialism, on the other hand, the system of central planning, the system of state ownership of the means of production to one degree or another, the system that views the individual not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end, again, has produced nothing, not a little, but nothing of value, and nothing has contributed nothing to human flourishing or human success and human life. Indeed, maybe the biggest mystery of modern times, and I think, indeed, the biggest mystery of modern times, is how, in spite of this history, in spite of the factual evidence, in spite of what has happened before the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, but indeed for 250 years, what doesn't just have to look at modern history, how socialism is even an acceptable idea or an acceptable ideology in polite company astounds me. Any more than, for example, Nazism would be an acceptable idea in polite company. It's not, thank God, it's not. Well, the God that doesn't exist, but thank whatever that it's not. But indeed, the communists and the socialists have managed to kill many more people, many more people by orders of magnitude than the Nazis have, yet we've accepted that anti-Semitism is evil and wrong and unacceptable. We've learned that from the history of the Second World War, and yet we've learned nothing from the history of Mao Zedong, of Mao's China, and of the Soviet Union. It is shocking that we even have to have this conversation. So I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Why? Why? And it's a question that keeps being repeated because we keep, not only are young people in, in, in the UK uh, seem to be passionately um, involved in a socialist agenda and you know, big, big uh, supporters of, uh, of uh, what's his name, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. In the United States, young people seem to be enamored by Bernie Sanders and his uh, at least claim uh, to be a socialist. But this is a worldwide phenomenon. There's a common example going on in, 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 um, in Latin America that I find quite fascinating. A country, I'm sure you all know which, used to be the richest country on a per capita basis in Latin America. Oil reserves that exceed those of Saudi Arabia. And over the last 25 or so years, that wealth, that progress, has been systematically dismantled to the point where today that country is the poorest country in a pretty poor region already, Latin America, on a per capita basis, in spite of the fact that the oil is still in the ground. It is a country that is being dismantled, where the wealth has been dismantled in the name of socialism, where farms have been converted from private property to communal farms, where the oil fields have been converted from private exploration and, and extraction to state ownership, the state ownership of the means of production. And as a consequence, one of the richest, most fertile lands where food was exported out to other country today cannot feed its own people to the point where infants are dying of malnutrition, people are eating their pets, there are no cats and dogs in Caracas. The zoos have been raided in order to eat the meat from the animals in the zoos. That's how desperate people are. Middle class, young people are dumpster diving into the trash cans 
to find remnants of food. And then nobody cares. There's no outcry. There's no condemnation. All the celebrities and all the politicians, including Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, who wave praise on, on Venezuela's you know, previous uh, dictator, Chavez, and the current authoritarian Mudaro, praise them to the hilt. <clears throat> Have stayed silent as people die in the streets of Caracas. Nobody seems, nobody seems to care. Why? Because they are starving in the name of socialism. That's probably a noble thing to do. At the same time, there was a country not far away from Venezuela, almost shares a border, which 30 years ago used to be the poorest country in Latin America. Far poorer than Venezuela. Literally the poorest country in a very poor region. And today, on a per capita basis, is the richest country in Latin America. And this country became rich because somewhat by accident, its economy was handed over to some free market economists, God forbid, and they actually implemented some privatization and actually implemented some free market reforms, privatized natural resources, privatized farmland, did land reform, privatized the social security system of the country, gave people an option between keep staying in the state-run social security system or in the private-run social security system. Guess how many people switched to the private? 99%. And that country is Chile. And that country it was, is thriving economically, has done phenomenally well over the last 25 years. And yet interestingly enough, and this is, this is where you, know, you have to scratch your head and wonder what the world is coming to. Chile has twice now elected a socialist as president. And the socialist president is systematically unwinding, undoing all the things that made Chile rich. I just read, I, I think this week, that they are going to start major reforms of the incredibly successful privatized social security system, thus attempting to destroy it. It's just nuts, <laughs> in my view. It's craziness what we are doing. 250 years ago, the reason I picked 250 years ago, anybody know, can we move this on? I want the white book. Um, what? Uh, anybody knows what, um, what the UN defines as extreme poverty? Less than $2 a day. Yeah, something that I say, let's use $3 a day, so a little higher. But anything less than $3 a day is considered by the UN, not an organization I typically quote, but this is, this is a good number. Uh, $3 a day is considered extreme poverty. What was, a, what was a percentage of the human population 250 years ago that lived on under $3 a day? I mean, in today's dollars, so no inflation adjusted, I mean, inflation adjusted dollars. So in today's dollars, in real dollars, in real inflation adjusted dollars. I mean, think about what it means to live on $3 a day. You can still find people in this world, unfortunately, still living on $3 a day. So we know what it looks like, and it's not pretty. It's not pretty, it's really, and, and we can't, you know, living in our modern, relatively capitalist societies, we can't imagine what living on $3 a day means. But what percentage of the population lived 250 years ago on $3 a day? In the West, and, and globally, it's just throw it on them. I think it's 90%? Yeah, I think 90% is not a bad estimate. The actual number is closer to 95. Almost everybody, I mean a few aristocrats who managed to, to exploit people and, and steal money and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, have a little bit more than everybody else, they were, they, were, they were up here, but everybody else, almost everybody else, 95% of the population, still at a global basis, but even in, in the West, the relatively rich West, lived on under $3 a day. Indeed, if you look at all of human history, and we're gonna, we're gonna do a little, you know, we're gonna go minus 10,000 years. So 10,000 years ago, about the time of the, of the um, agricultural revolution. And if you look, if this is $3 a day, this is about what income per capita was for 10,000 years. 
it did nothing. It went up a little bit under Rome, and then went down during the dark and middle ages, and went maybe up a little bit in the Renaissance, but it basically was flat for 10,000 years. We lived at approximately the same level. We basically farmed, ate the food we grew, we got up in the morning, worked all day, and went to sleep when the sun set because there was no lighting. You couldn't afford any kind of oil to actually light your place. You maybe could light a fire, but you know, it stinks. So it's, it's, it's hard to light a fire indoors. So basically your entire life was work, well, was life expectancy 40, during this period. 40 years old. Yeah, 40, was it, it's about 39, but yeah, it's a good, good estimate, about 39 years old. <coughs> um, life was hard, brutal, short, nasty, uh, you know, read your Hobbes. He was right about life in his period, in his time. And, you know, children, how many children, what percentage of children made it to age 10? Born alive to age 10. Yeah, less than 50% actually make it to age 10. Most of you would not have made it to age 10. And a lot of us, at least I, would be dead by now. And the rest of you would be middle-aged. That's what life was. 250 years ago. And 10,000 years ago. Doesn't matter. Life didn't change that much. And then something amazing happened. Miraculous, one would say. And that happened. That. We went from $3 a day to hundreds of dollars a day. And in Asia, it took a little bit longer. They stayed somewhere here, and then they grew it like that. But what caused this? What, what, what made this happen? Anybody want to give a date to the inflection point? When's the inflection point about? 1700. 1700's a little early, but not bad, because certainly intellectually, the beginning of the revolution that makes that possible starts around 1700 in the late 1600s. The Industrial Revolution in 1830 around then? Yeah, so 1830's probably a little late, so it's somewhere in between those dates. I like, I like a particular date, and I know you'll laugh when I say it, because it's a, it's a nice number that you can remember. It's 1776. Not because it's the actual date this inflection point happens, but because it symbolizes why that happens. And there are three reasons why 1776. One is the publication in England of a very famous book. Anybody know which? Just yell it out. Don't do the hand thing. You're way too polite. Uh, Adam Smith's Wealth. Wealth of Nations was published in 1776. Two, the commercialization, the first commercial use of a steam engine was in 1776. And three, of course, the founding of the United States of America. And in almost all regards, the founding of the U.S. Uh, the US is the most important of the three. But all three are combinations of an intellectual legacy that starts in the late 1600s, continues with John Locke and the, and, the, and the Scottish and French Enlightenment. And what is the Enlightenment about? What is the essential idea that the Enlightenment promotes that I think generates that curve upwards? The Enlightenment promotes basically two ideas. One is a derivative of the other. The first, the most important idea, is the efficacy of human reason. The ability of our reason to comprehend and understand no reality as it is. It is a twin to the scientific revolution. They happen at the same time, not accidentally. Newton teaches us that we can explain the physical world, we can explain the physical world by using our reason. That everybody, everybody can understand the motions of objects, the motions of planets, that the equations to explain them are not that hard. If you don't know Newton's three laws, if you didn't understand them in physics class, it's more than likely that it's because you had a lousy professor or teacher, because it not, it's not that hard. Now, when people suddenly realize, up until then, remember, how did knowledge come about? How do we know anything? When did knowledge come about before kind of the Enlightenment? How did people believe knowledge came from? 
Yeah, from a book written thousands of years ago, from mystical revelation, from Plato's philosopher kings, from the Pope, from somewhere. But that knowledge was not accessible to them as individuals. That it only got to them, filtered through the philosopher kings. Call them Christian philosopher kings or secular philosopher kings, it doesn't matter. Suddenly, in the Enlightenment, we learn that each one of us can know reality as it is. We start saying, well, if I, know, if I can know all this stuff, then why can't I control my own life? Why can't I choose my own profession? Why can't I live the way I want to live? Why can't I be free to produce what I want to produce? To think what I want to think? To make of my life what I want to make of that life? And as a consequence, what we get is a movement for freedom, a movement for liberty, which culminates in the Declaration of Independence of the United States as a declaration the most important political document, I believe, in human history. They didn't live up to it, of course, slavery and so forth, but as a declaration, declaring that each individual has an inalienable right to his own life, his own liberty, and the pursuit of his own happiness, changes the world. And what it unleashes is the innovation, the profit-seeking, the happiness-seeking, individuals all over the West where freedom is allowed. And the consequences, capitalism, and the consequences, a massive, massive increase in our quality standard of living, a doubling within about 100 years of life expectancy. Of course, now it's of course up to 84, or in somewhere in the 80s. A dramatic increase in the quality of life, a dramatic improvement across the board in human flourishing. Ultimately, it leads to the abolition of slavery, the emancipation of women, and almost every positive social trend of the last 250 years. And there are very few positive social trends before 250 years. What the socialists want is to get rid of this. Because all of this is a product of the recognition of the value of the individual, his mind, and his own life. Because the second idea of the Enlightenment is the sanctity of the individual. That the individual is the moral unit. Before 1776, for all intents and purposes, when you'd ask people who their life belonged to, what would be their answer? Who does your life belong to? King or God. King or God or tribe or nation or state or race or fill in the blank with some collective. Before 1776, each one of us knew that our life belonged to someone else. We had no autonomy over our lives. Not philosophically, not intellectually, and not physically in the real world. The beauty of the Declaration of Independence is that it declares that our lives belong to us as individuals. That the king does not own you, that the state does not own you, that the proletarian does not own you, that the race does not own you, that nobody owns you. That you are an independent, sovereign being. That your happiness and your well-being is your only responsibility. And that the job of the state, the only job of the state, is to protect you, is to make your life safe from the violence, from the coercion, from the fraud that might be committed on you by your neighbors or other states, terrorists, or fill in the blank. Again. But other than protecting you, the state had no role. It was to leave you alone so that you could pursue the values you believed when necessary for your survival and your ultimate flourishing. Socialism seeks to replace that. It seeks to tell you, no, your life doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the collective. It belongs to the group. You are just a sacrificial animal for the sake of other people's well-being. No matter if you've studied hard, worked hard, innovated, come up with great ideas, built a company, made hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even billions of dollars, it's not yours. It's your duty, it's your responsibility from each according to his ability 
to each according to his means. It's the people who didn't build. It's the people who didn't create. It's the people who didn't make. Your moral responsibility is to them, not to yourself. Your moral responsibility is to give. And if you're not going to give, which most of us would not, then we empower the state to violently take it from you to give to others. You do not have a right to your property. Indeed, the whole notion of private property is bizarre, according to socialism. Property is everybody's. No matter if you actually made the stuff, no matter if you actually built the stuff, no matter if you have the idea for it, it's not yours. It is owned by the collective, by the group. Your life does not belong to you. Your values do not belong to you. What you create and build does not belong to you. Your ideas do not belong to you. Socialism declares all of that belongs to the collective. It is a direct attack on individual sovereignty, on the idea of self-ownership, on the idea of the moral right of an individual to pursue their own values and their own happiness and their own well-being. And indeed, that is where its popularity comes from. The popularity of socialism is that it is not a new idea. That it doesn't challenge you to think any differently than our forefathers. Socialism is just a rehashing of an ancient moral code that has been with us for at least 2,000 years. It is a rehashing of a moral code that says that your moral responsibility in life is to serve others, is to live for the sake of others, is to sacrifice yourself for the sake of others. Indeed, the more needy they are, the more you should be sacrificing. That's not socialism. That's Christianity. That's most ancient moralities that came before the Industrial Revolution, before capitalism. Indeed, to this day, we teach our kids that to be noble, to be good, to be virtuous, is to be selfless, is to sacrifice, is to give freely, willingly, and not to expect anything in return. That is real nobility. That is real goodness. That's what we teach. And if we teach that, then why expect any different than a socialist outcome? Ayn Rand challenges that. She asks a simple question. Why? Why is other, ha other people's happiness more important than mine? Why is other people's lives more important than mine? Why should I sacrifice for other people and not live for myself? Why is it my happiness? Why shouldn't my happiness be the purpose of my life? Indeed, as a living being, we must choose values to survive, to flourish. It's what we are. We have one shot at this life. We have one life here. Shouldn't we live it our own sake? To make our own lives the best that they can be? You don't get a second chance. You don't get another one at this. Why not be happy? Why not be successful? Why not be prosperous? Why is life about the other rather than about you? Each one of you. And as long as you're not exploiting other people, and as long as you don't allow them to exploit you, this is what life should be about. It should be about the pursuit of happiness. Your individual happiness. So, socialism wins because it's a secularization of a morality that's been with us for 2,000, 3,000 years. And we still haven't had the guts we still haven't had the courage. We still haven't had the backbone to shrug it off. And to learn from reality, from what works, from what actually achieves human flourishing. We need to reject the mysticism of socialism. We need to reject the morality of otherism that socialism embeds in us. And we need to embrace a new morality. And until we do, 
we will keep going up and down and up and down as we adopt more socialism and then, you know, if the socialism crushes our wealth, so we liberalize our economies and then we have more socialism and then, you know, an endless cycle which we don't learn from, which is, again, what's stunning to me is, is the fact that we just don't learn from experience. And again, I think the reason is that our morality guides our interpretation of that experience. Socialism is evil. By what standard? By the standard of human life. I believe that the good is that that supports, that promotes human life and human flourishing. The good is that which supports and promotes human life and human flourishing. By any measure, what has led to human life, human flourishing, is capitalism. Freedom, liberty, individualism. Leaving people alone to pursue their dreams. What has led, what socialism has led to is again destruction. Central planning doesn't work, has never worked, cannot work. Why can't central planning work? What is the essential flaw in central planning? You can't get enough information. Yeah, so you can't get enough information, which is Hayek's reason. But why can't you get enough information? What is it that makes it impossible, not just that the computer's not fast enough or big enough, but literally metaphysically impossible to get enough information so that you can centrally plan? What makes that impossible? What makes it impossible is all of us are different. All of us have our own lives. All of us have our own values. All of us like different things and have different preferences and different wants, and different needs, and different desires, and different passions. And there's no way to plan that. The beauty of capitalism is it leaves you free to follow those passions. And if their passions turn out to be not too productive, what happens to you? You fail. But if you're half smart, when you fail, you learn from the failure, and you don't do it again. Failure is part of life. What central planning tries to do is try to tell you what those passions should be, what your life should be like, how you should behave, how much wealth you should create, what kind of products you should want. Again, it replaces your mind with the mind of the philosopher king, with the mind of Stalin or Lenin or Mao or Chavez or Mudaro. And you can't replace your mind. Each one of your minds is unique. Each one of your minds is special. It's different. And even if we're all equally rational and equally smart, we are going to want different things with different people. It's beautiful. I mean, life would be horrible if we were all the same. Even if everybody was like me, it would still be horrible. What makes life interesting is the division of labor, the division of values, the fact that we indeed are all different that we all pursue different things. So it's time to resurrect the spirit of the Enlightenment, of the period that led up to this massive increase in wealth, this massive increase in flourishing, this massive increase in prosperity. We need to resurrect those two ideas that were at the heart of the Enlightenment. The idea of reason as primary, as our means of knowledge, of the efficaciousness of reason, it actually, you actually use it to learn about reality. You can actually know the world around you. You do not need revelation. You do not need philosopher kings or furors to tell you what life is really about. You get to decide that. As long as you use your mind, as long as you're rational, you will probably make good decisions. And we need to resurrect as a consequence of that the idea of individualism, the idea of the sanctity of each one of our lives, of the values that we have, and reject the idea of sacrifice. Socialism is very good at sacrifice. It sacrificed probably somewhere between 100 and 200 million people for the sake of the proletarian. And the proletarian at the end of the day was still dirt poor and produced nothing and created nothing. So not only is it unthinkable to sacrifice human beings for any goal, 
It's never right to do human sacrifice. But the goal wasn't even achieved. And yet we still find it appealing. So I encourage you all, read Ayn Rand. Uh, she is, in my view, the, uh, the thinker that brings back these Enlightenment ideas, these Enlightenment values. Um, and uh, study history. Because I think we study history, it really is hard to be a socialist, though. Maybe even impossible. Thank you all. They all seem to be open. Uh, yeah, all right, we've got plenty of time for questions of any kind. Um, my question is, so you seem to talk mostly like state is kind of socialist, central planning, things like yes. that, so the union. Yes. Um, obviously there are a variety of ideologies out there, and I was wondering what you would then say to uh, anarchist philosophies which do pride themselves and value uh, individuality and take care of the individual and don't murder people en masse. So what would you say to that? Well, it's always interesting when I give talks that um, the anarchists, either, the, either on the left or on the right, come after me because I'm not an anarchist. So they, I'm an anarcho capitalist on one side and an anarcho communist on the other side, or, or anarcho whatever uh, on the other side, come after me. I am not an advocate for anarchy because I believe that anarchy is a recipe for violence. I think what anarchy, you need a system of justice. You need definitions of right and wrong in terms of when is it wrong for me to punch you and when is it okay for me to punch you. It's only okay for me to punch you if you're trying to punch me, right, first. So you need clear definition of what is self-defense, what is aggression, what is property, what's a violation of property, who the property belongs to so we know who's being, whose rights are being violated, whose rights are not being violated. And I know leftist anarchists don't believe in any property, which I think then means everything is not owned by anybody, which is, you know, in, in so many regards a complete disaster. Uh, but I think that anarchy, however you think about it, either from the, from the so-called capitalist perspective or the so-called leftist perspective, ultimately always devolves into gang warfare. It's because the, the only way left to resolve disputes is through violence. It is through my police, my, the police force I hired versus the police force you hired, or your friends versus my friends if we don't believe in police forces. But they're going to be disputes. They're always going to be disputes. Some of them friendly, some of them rational. We, we often sign contracts and we're all good people, but we disagree about what the contract means maybe 10 years later. And some of them because some people are just nah, bad people. Right? They're, they're cooks out there. They're just bad people. And you need a mechanism to resolve them. So I believe government is a necessary good, not a necessary evil. I don't think society can actually exist in any kind of healthy way without a government. And then the question is, what kind of government do we need? And I believe a government that's limited, limited to one thing, only one thing. And that is the protection of the liberty, the freedom of the individual. That is only to arbitrate disputes and to protect us from the crooks and criminals and murderers and rapists and so on. So other than that, government has no rule. Now let me, let me address some other variants of, 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 of social so, I, so um, there have been many attempts over the last, certainly over the last hundred years, but really going back even further than that, to create all kinds of uh, communal living. Right? So in Israel, there was a, a lengthy experiment with something called the kibbutz, which was about as communal as you get. Right? All the land was jointly owned. At its peak, at, at, at the peak of the kibbutz, you, you didn't, your children weren't even yours. So the children, you had the baby, and the baby was taken to a nursery, and it was raised with all the other children, and you got to visit the nursery just as much as anybody else got to visit the nursery. You didn't get to work at the nursery because your kids were there. You rotated jobs, so you didn't have any specialization. So you worked, let's say, a month in the farm, and a month in the kitchen, and a month in the nursery. I mean, as idealistic of a communal kind of setting as possible. There were no kitchens in people's apartments, because the idea that you would cook for yourself was too individualistic. So you had a, a, a communal kitchen which people rotated through, and you could only eat your meals in the communal kitchen. Everybody had exactly the same size apartment. Everybody had exactly the same furniture. I mean, they really tried right, to make this as utopian. And of course, at the end of the day, it was voluntary. You could leave. So it wasn't, there was no murder, there was no destruction because they didn't have the, 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 the power of the state, luckily. They had 
Yeah, what do you mean? A lot of that. Uh, so what was the result? We, we've got we've got like 75 years of good history on this, right? The kibbutz was never economically sustainable. They always lost money from the beginning, and they kept increasing the amount of money they were losing over time. So they could not feed themselves without heavy subsidies originally before the state of Israel was created from uh, contributions from Jews like the Rothschilds in, in Europe who sent money so they wouldn't starve. And then later on, once the state of Israel was created from the, from the Israeli government that subsidized the kibbutzim heavily right until about 10, 15 years ago when the Israeli government started cutting the subsidies. And of course, as soon as they cut the subsidies, what happened to the kibbutzim? They privatized themselves. Today, everybody has their own apartment, everybody has a job, everybody gets a salary. Oh, you couldn't even have money outside of the kibbutz. All the money was shared. So once you joined the kibbutz, all your assets were put into a pool. Now, of course, that's all gone. So there is no kibbutzim anymore. They completely self-destructed. But even when they existed, so, so that's a kind of a materialistic wealth perspective. But what about the social relationship? Isn't it wonderful to sit every night and have dinner together and hold hands and sing kumbaya? No, it turns out. It turns out that the social environment within these kibbutzim were horrible. People envied one another constantly because some worked hard and some didn't. Some actually were productive and some were not. Some were good with children and some were not good with children. And yet they couldn't specialize. So the people who worked hard resented the fact that they had exactly the same stuff as the people who were lazy. I used to watch them sneaking in at 11 o'clock, the people who didn't want to work. They sneaked in. There was no consequences to not working. You still had the same food, the same apartment, the same television, the same treatment of your kids. No consequences for bad behavior, except social consequences. So the co social consequences were people stabbed each other in the back, they gossiped constantly. Uh, you know, sex was used as, as, as power in order to humiliate people. It was a disaster. It was one of the most horrible social environments I've ever seen. The same is true of the many communes the hippies in the 60s tried. And there are lots of other experiments from both agricultural and other types of communes that have been tried over many, 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 many decades. This is not something new, right? Socialism has been around for a long time, to some extent even predating Marx. So a lot of people have experimented with different variants of this. And it's never worked. It just doesn't work. Why? Because it goes against human nature. It goes against the idea that if I make something, if I produce something, if I create something, I want it to be mine. And I don't want to share it with somebody who hasn't done the work, who doesn't deserve it. Dessert is a really, really important thing for human beings. And what you deserve is a consequence materially, from a material perspective, what you produce. If you don't produce stuff, you don't deserve it. If you produce it, you deserve it. And you know, you, we can try to pretend we're good socialists, but when it actually comes down to it, nobody actually wants to give when he's actually created stuff to people who are not creating anything. Unless, you know, there's a small number of people who really can't help themselves and we give them charity and help them out. But as a mandate, it, it just doesn't work. So, I, I mean, there are just no examples of, of, of these systems working. Even, and, and this is the other thing about capitalism and socialism. What I find fascinating is, if you try ca a little bit of capitalism, that is if you, take, if you take a country and you give a little region in the country property rights, and you don't even have the whole rule of law and everything that capitalism embedded, but just give them property rights and respect for contracts. That part of the country will go like that. If you take a capitalist country and you take a little segment of it and you, and you socialize it and you create communal farms and you do these things, it goes like that. So it's to the extent you practice capitalism, you succeed, to the extent that you practice socialism, you fail. The more socialist an economy is, the slower its growth, the slower its creativity, there's almost no innovation, and the more capitalist an economy is. So there's, there's, a, there's a direct correlation between wealth, innovation, productivity, human individual flourishing, success, and the level of economic freedom you provide people. You know, look at somewhere like, uh, <coughs> like Hong Kong. Anybody been to Hong Kong? <coughs> Nobody's been to Hong Kong. All right, everybody, once <coughs> in your life, you should go to Hong Kong. It's a stunning place. It's a stunningly beautiful, amazing place. Hong Kong 75 years ago had about a few tens of thousands of people on it. It was a fishing village in the middle of nowhere on a rock, no natural resources, nothing. I mean, a port you could argue, but there are lots of places that could be a good port. 
And the British came there, and all they did, all the British did, was establish the rule of law, respect property rights and contract, and establish real contract law. And other than that, left people alone. No safety net, no social guarantees, none, no redistribution of wealth. Today there's a bit of a safety net, but in the, in, originally there was nothing. And today, how many people live on this rock? Seven and a half million. More skyscrapers than New York City. Per capita GDP, which is a measure of economic well-being, higher than the United States on a purchasing power parity. So they really, the standard of living is higher than the United States. What it took America 250 years to produce, they did in 70 years because they had freedom, because they had a little bit of capitalism. Capitalism works wherever you try it. And people are pretty happy there. It's all like, oh, you know, they're climbing now because the Chinese are pressing them. They're taking away property rights. They're taking away freedom of speech. They're taking away, and the students are out demonstrating for more democracy. But it's not that they, it's not, the problem there is not economic. The economy's doing great, and they are flourishing. So again, I, I just don't know where the examples are. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I want to put life and see why you call people, people like Corbyn or like the modern, modern socialists socialists. 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 Because, because they, they seem to me to be the yeah, antithesis of what socialism is about, about which is a concern about human flourishing. So, so for example, Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn hates economic growth. growth. Yeah. He, he doesn't, doesn't like it. He, he thinks, thinks we can't grow our economies at six, seven percent a year like China or even a hundred or unlimited economic growth. And if you look back to the original socialists like Marx, what, what they, they loved about, about capitalism, capitalism is, is that, that it grew, it, it produced wonders greater, greater than the pyramids. Yes. Marx was totally infused. Yeah, Marx was much smarter of a socialist than the socialist today. Yes, precisely. So the socialists today hate all the best parts of capitalism, which is a mistake. But the, the thing is that capitalism itself, I mean, you talk about using one's reason, which is a core enlightenment. Enlightenment idea, I, I grant you, and that we learn from experience. But the thing about capitalism is that it, it grows and then it falls. It goes into regular crises. And that experience has shown that uh, capitalism doesn't work. I and mean, at present, you could even say capitalism is in a rot, in a crisis. We're not growing enough. Yes. So, what the challenge we face today, I think, as if, if you would say socialists, is to harness our reason and our knowledge of history to come up with an alternative to capitalism which produces human flourishing consistently. And well, what I think you're doing is giving up on human reason because you are actually accepting a system which you know by experience goes into crisis. And you're saying we should just accept it and not look beyond it. So, so that's my accusation. No, that's, that's, that's good. And it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a relatively original question. I put that one. Uh, so that's good. Uh, one of the reasons, so just go back to some of the comments you make and I'll, take them, I'll try to take them all. Uh, the reason I call Corbyn a socialist is because he calls it himself and people refer to him as a socialist. I, I'm not in the business of deciding who is a true socialist and who is not. Um, and it, because he, he exemplifies certain socialist characteristics like uh, the nationalization of industries, the, the, the idea of, 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 of putting the state as a central planner over industry, which is a typical socialist policy. No, I understand why you don't think he's a socialist, and that's, and that's fine, and I'm, I'm willing to accept elements of that. Um, let me just say, and, and I have to say this, uh, uh, I don't believe Marx for one second believed in human flourishing and strove towards human flourishing. I don't think that was his agenda. I don't think he believed it. I think generally Marx was a hater, not a lover, and not somebody who, who really embraced human flourishing. And if you read his letters with Engels, where they describe which people they're going to eliminate and which people they're, they're, they're good. And, I mean, he, had the, he, he, he was one of the most racist, uh, he, Engels in particular, but Marx, of course, endorsed all this, one of the most racist, horrible human beings I can even imagine, and to, to associate him with human flourishing is bizarre. But I'll give you this. Marx projected a system that it calls optimistic about the future. And I think many of today's left are not about the future, and they're not about economic growth, they're not about human flourishing. They are essentially nihilists. And I think that is a characteristic of modern leftist ideology, is nihilism. It's a post-Nietzschean kind of uh, a, a real nihilistic approach uh, to life. And, and, and you can't accuse Marx, at least in that sense, of being a nihilist. I think the results of his ideology are nihilistic. But he at least projected an idea of one day we all come together as the proletarian and live happy, successful, wonderful, prosperous, rich lives. And, and you know nobody today on the modern left actually projects that. Um, I don't agree with you about capitalism. 
C completely. I think the evidence is quite to the contrary of what you suggest. Capitalism does not fail. There is no evidence that capitalism has failed. And I would take you at crisis after crisis after crisis and show you that capitalism has not failed. And today, the sluggish economy of the world is driven by one major factor, and that is statism. The, 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 the lack of innovation, the lack of progress, the lack of, 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 of economic growth today is a complete result of the growth of the state, of the fact that the state today, that spending is consumption, it is wasteful, instead of that money being invested that money returning to the hands of a the capitalist, they can invest it, they can, they can invest it in production, in, in job growth, in innovation, in creation, in building. So it's the exact rejection over the last hundred years of capitalism that has brought about the Great Depression, that brought about the 2008 crisis, that has brought about the slow economic growth we're experiencing today. And in China, China's a great example, because I know a lot of people on the left, or I don't know if you consider yourself on the left, but, but, but a lot of people who, who want an alternative to capitalism look at China and say, look, they're growing at these astounding rates and they're run by the Communist Party. Well, you have to go look and you have to go to China and actually look at where the growth has happened. The growth and the success of China happens where the Chinese government doesn't pay any attention. When the Chinese government has said, go do whatever you want, we're not gonna look over there, we're not gonna, take, we're not gonna worry about you. That's where they can have growth. In other words, in the areas where they allow for individual freedom, individual innovation, in other words, for capitalism to flourish, those are the areas that have generated astronomical growth, growth that's been held back by the state-owned enterprises and by the central planning of the Chinese government. Every area where the Chinese government has centrally planned has been a disaster. Every area that central government of China has, has, has embraced has not worked. And, and I don't know how many of you know of, of kind of the transition from 79 under Deng Xiaoping to today of Chinese economy, but it's absolutely fascinating. It's a wonderful little book called How China Became Capitalist. Now, I don't like the title because I don't think China's capitalist, but it's certainly not socialist. It's got elements of both, like all countries, uh, but where it grows are those elements of capitalism. But it's a book by, uh, by, the, by a, a Nobel Prize winner in economics by the name of Rana Kos, and a Chinese author whose name I can't remember. Rana Kos was 101 years old when he wrote the book, so it's, it's pretty astounding uh, for that fact. But it's a short book. It's wonderful. It's not the best written book in the world, but it's got fantastic information on how that transformation happened. And I'll just give you one story of how China became so successful at growing food. In the 1960s, communal farms generated mass starvation. People died in the tens of millions during the 1960s. That's just a historical fact, right? And Mao Zedong knew this, and basically they did nothing, partially because he believed that this was a weaning out process of the weak and so on, but also partially because this was a system. They believed the communal farms, and this is what it generated. Anyway, throughout post-1960s, farming in China, farmers in China struggled and starved. There was real hunger in, in those communal farms all over China. And this one little, China, this one little community in China, uh, I forget the name of the village, but this little village in central China, they got together one day and they said, look, this is not working. We're dying. So let's do this. You will pretend that that piece of land over there is yours and this piece of land is mine. And whatever you produce on that is yours and you get to keep the surplus and I'll get to keep the surplus here. And they basically divided all the land the village communally owned into private or pseudo-private lots that individuals now cultivated, maintained, and got the surplus from. And guess what happened? Within a year, they were producing massive surpluses. Suddenly, there was plenty not only to feed the village, but they were exporting to other villages. And the central, the, the Communist Party went down there and they said, what the hell is going on here? What have you done? This is great, this is miraculous. We want to do this. And, and you know, the farmers tried to hide it, but ultimately it came out what they done. And the immediate response of the communists was, well, you know, you kill these people. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? They're embracing capitalism. And to Deng Xiaoping's credit, now Deng Xiaoping was a really bad guy, but he did some good things here and there. To Deng Xiaoping's credit, he basically said, no, this works. He was a complete pragmatist. He said, this works, so leave it alone. Not only that, if it works in this village, let's see if it works in another three villages. And they tried the same system in another three villages, and guess what? When you give people private ownership, they produce, and they create, and they create surpluses. So it worked over there. And they said, okay, we'll convert all of China's farming, or most of China's farming, to this model, and it's, that's what they did. Even though to this day they don't have private property. 
they have what I call pseudo private property. They pretend that they own the land. Uh, the government still hasn't given them full rights over the land. So capitalism works. And, and, and I'm happy to explain a 2008 crisis and I'm happy to explain a Great Depression. But the fact is that when markets are left alone, they flourish and succeed. And even today, if you look at where innovation happens, where does innovation happen today? What industry innovates? Of all the industries out there, where, where do you see 8, 9, 10, 12% growth in an industry? Which industry? Technology. Yeah, technology, this industry, right? This industry happens to be the least regulated, the least controlled, the least government influence of all industries. So it grows. And it's left alone in yeah, Is there a bubble? Sure, there's a bubble, but the bubble is self-correcting and immediately it goes afterwards. Right? There was a bubble in 99, and partially funded by the Federal Reserve, a non-capitalist organization, a very statist entity. But after 2001, it grows again. And where don't you get innovation? Well, things like airplanes. We basically fly the same airplanes today as we did 50 years ago. Same engines, the same basic body. You know, they make them bigger a little bit, and they use fiber or whatever carbon fiber and stuff like that to make them lighter, but it's the same basic design as it was 50 years ago. Why? Because it's so heavily regulated. And the one innovation we used to have in airplanes was what? What was the one airplane that broke the mold? Concorde. The Concorde. When we grounded that, that's gone. Nobody, I mean there's one company now building a supersonic jet, we'll see if they let it fly. And the same with the automobile, the internal combustion automobile, and the same with every industry where the state regulates. And to call what we have today capitalism is bizarre given the mountains of regulation, the mountains of state control, the fact that for years at Microsoft, a government official used to sit to sign off on any deal they make, <laughs> or that today, when J.P. Morgan opens the door at, eight, at, at 9 a.m. in the morning, 200 government employees go to work at J.P. Morgan to make sure that they follow all the regulations and do all the rules and sign off on every one of the decisions. So many of the industries today have been nationalized, without saying they'd be nationalized. Basically, the banking sector in the world is, is run by governments, it's not run by private entrepreneurs. So, no, I think we know what the system is that produces human flourishing, we know what the system is that produces human wealth, and that is capitalism. And it doesn't need altering. We don't need a new system. We just need to embrace it fully and consistently, which we've never really done. You mentioned Chile as a good example of economic growth. Sorry, yeah. Um, but they obviously, during the period of economic growth, had quite a repressive dictator called Pinochet in power. Sure, part of it, yeah. Um, so to so what extent do you think that economic freedoms, which you described in Chile, can work without political freedoms? So it, it is a sad, it, it's sad that it happened to be Pinochet who embraced this. Although, of course, Pinochet is one of the few dictators in history to actually hold an election about continuing or not continuing and turning everything over to the democratic thing. He should have been tried for the crimes that he committed. He killed thousands of people and he's an evil, he's an evil man. But he ha and he, and he wasn't like he believed in capitalism either. He, he, was, he was floundering after he took over and the Chilean economy was plummeting and it was doing no good. And there was a group of uh, economists in uh, Chile who were trained by, in Chicago by Milton Friedman. They were called the Chicago Boys. And he basically said, you guys try, I don't know what's going to work, something has to work. And they took over the economy and they basically privatized everything and so on, and, and it led to success. The success continued after Pinochet was gone. So well after Pinochet, really, until about five, six years ago, you know, Chile was on this con constant path of continuous privatization and improvement and economic growth. So it didn't require Pinochet, because once he was gone, it continued. One wonders when anybody would have embraced these ideas if they weren't, in a sense, forced. That's probably why they're going away now, and why they voted socialist, because it never really was something people believed in, right? So I think capitalism works when people believe in it, right? You have to have people believe. If you don't believe in capitalism, you won't get it. If you, don't, if you, believe, in, uh, if you believe in a mixed economy, you're gonna get a mixed economy. If you believe in socialism, you'll get socialism. We get the politicians we deserve. We get the politics we deserve. When, uh, you know, when we start voting real free market, politicians into, into power, and we haven't in a very, very long time, then we'll get free markets. Uh, when we do, we get, when we elect people who are marginally more free markets, we get upswings in the economy, which is not bad, but it doesn't last because we don't really believe in it. So we elect the opposite the next election. So what has to happen is a fundamental intellectual shift in among the voters, among you, right? 
for this to be sustainable, if, if it's going to be sustainable. And, and I, I believe that to do it, you need this moral revolution. You need a change in the approach to ethics, our approach to morality, our approach to epistemology in the sense of the efficacy of reason, which is in decline, right? The postmodernists today tell us, probably here at this university, that reality is what? Well, we don't know. Reality is unknowable. And uh, reason is impotent. And all you have is your emotions, and because all you have is your emotions, you better cling to the closest group that looks a lot like you. And, uh, and all we have are identity politics. That's what it, we've devolved into, tribalism. What we used to have way back then. We seem to keep going back to when we were poor and life sucked uh, big time. But we keep wanting that somehow, because tribalism is, is the word of the day, both on the right and on the left. The right and the left are both devolved into racism and tribalism. Uh, scary stuff these days. Yeah. Um, you speak a lot about human flourishing, and I think it's interesting that you use uh, GDP yeah. as perhaps a measure of human flourishing or state prosperity. Yeah. Um, I wonder where you stood on, from more of like a socio-legal perspective, Martha Nussbaum, who looks or kind of argues that GDP omits actually capturing development of individuals. Um, I think she goes as far as to point out the failings of GDP. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of GDP either. It's just the best that we have. It's a, num it's a measure of wealth. It's not a measure of flourishing. It's a measure of wealth. But I also added life expectancy. That's, a, that's you know, if you die at 39, life's not that good. If you could die at 99, which a lot of people are doing these days, and I, I meet these 90-year-olds, and they're doing really well, right? Their mind is still there, and they're physically active. It's pretty astounding, right? And if you add the fact that at least the beginning of this, you know, so an unbelievable flourishing in the arts. Right? Think about Beethoven. You know, I, I love the music of Beethoven. I don't know if you guys like him or not. Maybe the age of rap Beethoven is not that popular. But I think Dave Beethoven is one of the great artists of all of, all of human history. Beethoven is the first musician of, of serious music to actually make a living from his music. He actually held concerts and sold tickets. It was capitalism, right? Beautiful capitalism. Mozart, remember, could only make money by doing what? By sucking up to the church and to the aristocrats. Beethoven didn't have to do that anymore. He could count in a middle class, a growing middle class, sell tickets to his concerts, and people sat and listened to beautiful music for a long time. That was made possible by that. So it's not irrelevant that we have money to our flourishing. Remember that when we didn't have money, all we did, we couldn't read. We didn't know how to. Nobody had an education. We couldn't read because there was no light. And during the day when there was light, we had to work. And, and if you didn't work, what happened to you? You died. There's no, there no well-being. There's no agency that came in and saved you. You died. So it's only this wealth that is made possible, that is made possible, other measures of human flourishing. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, my kids, I told my, my kids, they're about your age, and I told my kids, follow your passion. Right? Do what you love doing. Unfortunately, they followed my advice. You know, one of them is a musician. And luckily, we live in a relatively wealthy culture in which musicians can make a living. Barely. You know, they scrape up, but he's making a living. The other one writes comedy in Hollywood. They pay zero, right? Until you make it into television and they start paying a lot. But zero, right? But he works on the side and he works here and there. And luckily, we live in a rich enough society in which somebody can perform comedy three times a week or whatever and still survive, right? There were, there were very few comedians back then, you know, a quote jest or two, a few musicians here and there. I mean, wealth makes possible the ability to pursue one's passion, the ability to, to, to do things that in a poor culture you cannot do. You know, in, in, um, in North Korea, there are not a lot of uh, entertainers, right? Uh, unless they're paid by the government. In, uh, in, uh, even in, you know, I don't know, in Laos or in Burma, there are not a lot of people who do that. Right? Because there's just there's no, no customers, nobody has the money to pay them in order to do it. So I believe that by any real measure of human flourishing, and I don't think Nussbaum has a real measure of human flourishing, I think she's floundering, but, but by any real measure of human flourishing, we are so much better off post-capitalism, during capitalism than we were before. And that any comparable, to a socialist state, one would have, right? So by every measure that I can think of, at least, and I, you know, I'm willing to accept other measures. And GDP is not a good measure, and the primary reason GDP is not a good measure 
is because GDP counts government consumption as if it's production. So the GDP goes up during war, which is ridiculous, because war is when you destroy stuff, and you bomb stuff, and you, and you knock down buildings. It's not exactly pro-economy. It's not exactly wealth enhancing. But GDP goes up. Why? Because the government is spending money on tanks and on bombs and on fighter airplanes and all that stuff, which are not productive. They don't enhance human well-being. But overall, if you take the scope of history, GDP is correlated with wealth. It's not accurate, but it's correlated. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that during the same period, your state has been growing more and more. Do you think that that might be why people view capitalism with such because the state is basically the main propaganda tool in yes. our society. Yeah, yeah. And the the state is basically in competition with capitalism. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so I think that's right. I think a big part of why people are still so sympathetic to socialism is because the state controls education, right? more important than anything else. Right? It controls education. So it controls how you think. It controls the history you learn. It controls the economics you learn, and you learn lousy economics. Economics 101 at every university I've ever been at, with maybe the exception of two or three in the world, is just garbage. Right? You learn the perfect competition model. Anybody taken uh, that? That's all of that. The monopoly, all of that is garbage. It's just not economics. It's just bullshit. And it shouldn't be an economics textbook. But that's what you study because that's what the 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 the, peep, the power. The powers want you to study. It's not that this is a conspiracy. It's just that it reinforces one another. Ten years a great reinforcing mechanism for, for, for people not to innovate and not to create new things because they challenge the existing order, and the existing order is the one who grants you ten years. Thank you.